All right, thank you everyone. Um, we're gonna get started. It's really my great pleasure to introduce Timnit, um, who is going to give our second keynote for this first SATML conference. So Timnit has had such a profound impact on our field that it's hard to select which papers to mention when introducing her. So I chose three. Um, I think earlier on, her work on deep learning to analyze uh, street view imagery and estimate demographics of US neighborhoods was quite interesting. Um, for instance, I remember that we could predict um, based on Timnit's findings, who would vote for certain political parties based on the types of cars that are parked in neighborhoods, which is quite interesting. Then Timnit had uh, a number of discoveries on the limitations of facial recognition technology uh, in a project called uh, Gender Shades. And then more recently was a co-author of the paper titled Stochastic Parrots, um, in which her and her co-authors raised a number of limitations of large language models, uh, including bias, potential to deceive, and environmental costs, just to cite a few. And I think we can all agree, given the last couple of months, that uh, this paper uh, was just a little bit ahead of its time, but uh, was right to point out all of these limitations. So now Timnit is the founder of DARE, which is the Distributed AI Research Institute, uh, where the mission of this institute is to prevent the harm of AI and bring diverse perspectives to promote a more beneficial application of AI. So I'm really thankful that Timnit agreed to spend the next hour with us today. Um, she's very, very busy, has received so many awards. Uh, last year was named one of Time's 100 Most Influential. So thank you so much, Timnit. The floor is yours. Um, I'll mute our mic while you're speaking. And then when you're done, we can take questions from the audience. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. That was such a beautiful introduction. I feel super honored um, to be here. And um, yeah, I wish I could be there in person, but I really can't. Um, I couldn't really travel. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I wanted to have this conversation about AGI, um, given uh, the, the kinds of things that are going on. And um, so I, um, what I was going to talk about today is based on a paper I worked on recently. And, um, you know, I don't know, I learned stuff while working on this paper, you might not, it might not be news to you. Um, but I, you know, sort of wanted to, that's the conversation I want to have today. And um, the reason is because, you know, I, you know, about like 10 years ago, or so or even before that, when I was working in the space, I didn't think that the whole AGI thing was very central. It wasn't like mainstream. I mean, I don't know, maybe some of you might have a different experience, but that was not my feeling. Um, and now I think that even people who didn't, you know, <laughs> want to work on it or, or something like that have to like write AGI in all of their documents and things like that. I'm hearing from some of my friends and some um, organizations. And so I was just trying to figure out like what's going on. Why, why is that the case? Um, so, you know, so that's what, uh, you know, kind of want to talk about, um, I, I don't know, you know, I think you all know, like everybody's talking about AGI right now, right? I don't want to, I don't need to give examples of that and stuff. So the first question I had was like, what is it? Uh, what is AGI? I, um, so I'm like trying to find different people who define it differently. So the OpenAI um, one, they say highly autonomous systems that outperform humans at most economically valuable work. All right. Then there is this book I was um, looking at that was the first book on AGI, I guess, Contemporary Approaches to AGI. I think it says a software program that can solve a variety of complex problems in a variety of different domains and that controls itself autonomously with its own thoughts, worries, feelings, strengths, weaknesses, and predispositions. All right. Then I saw Peter Voss, who says he also was one of the people who coined the term AGI, that a computer system that matches or exceeds the real-time cognitive, not physical ability of a smart, well-educated human 
what does smart mean and what does well educated mean? I mean, those, those are some uh, we can get into some issues there. And then here's Russell Norvig. It's like a universal algorithm for learning and acting under any environment. So like what I hear when I see this is like, this is sort of what I understand it to be. It's like a thing that can do anything for everyone, any environment. And so I was like, you know, this to me as an engineer before I was, um, before I got into the space, I was an electrical engineer. I did electronics. And, you know, um, we were very much into, you know, scoping out our systems, understanding stability, like that was all, all the class I took, right? Um, and then, you know, you know, trying to ship products, your, most of your work is like, um, scoping things out, testing things out, documenting whatever. And this to me felt like an unscoped system with a goal of trying to do everything. Um, and so I was like, why? You know, and and this book, you know, it says they say it's a fully, you know, it's not a fully well defined system, but then they still want to build it. So I'm I'm kind of trying to understand why, 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 why do people want to build this thing, and what is it? So that's kind of the rest of my talk, right? <laughs> it's gonna be, you know, why is it that people want to build this thing? Uh, what what's the motivation, and then what what has the consequences? What have the consequences been? Um, and the short answer is that it's rooted in the 20th century Anglo-American, you know, eugenics tradition. And then the long answer is the rest of my talk. So let's go to the long answer. Um, so this is how I'm going to um, try to structure the rest of my talk. And this is the first time I'm giving this talk. So I'm going to try to make sure that I'm, um, you know, uh, timing it properly for everything. But um, yeah, so a, a brief introduction to eugenics. Then we'll go to, you know, what we call second wave eugenics. And then we'll talk about the AGI utopia and the AGI apocalypse. So when you know we're like now we're going to talk a little bit about a beef introduction to eugenics. So when most people think about eugenics, they don't think of it as a progressive movement, right? Um, that was popular among scientists. But that's what eugenics was. It was a very it was considered a, a very progressive movement, and it was it was thriving in a lot of universities, Harvard, Stanford. Um, and this um, quote from Philippa Levine and Alice Bashford says, the optimism of eugenics and its aspiration to apply scientific ideals actively was among the reasons it so frequently attracted progressives and liber liberals. Um, and this is um, the Stanford Eugenics History Project. Um, the first president uh, of Stanford University were, was uh, one of the most um, powerful eugenicists of the 20th century, right? Um, and he definitely believed in the, um, you know, that the human race could be improved by restri restricting the reproduction of inferior populations, such as disabled people and people of color. And he believed um, in the hierarchy of races uh, with white people at the top and black people at the bottom. He promoted the forced realization of disabled people, Etc. And by the way, I don't know if any if you go to if you've been to Stanford, you know that Jordan Hall is like there's all sorts of um, places dedicated to to this guy. Um, another big one at Stanford was also Shockley, you know, who got the Nobel Prize right for physics for the transistor. But he was also, I mean, he wrote more things about eugenics probably than than that. So. You know, uh, most people think eugenics equals the Nazis, right? Um, and then they also think eugenics is over after World War II, but both are wrong. Um, the Nazis actually studied California steril sterilization program in detail when they were working on their blueprint of the racial hygiene policies that obviously eventually led to the Holocaust. Um, and if it, eugenics also did not end after World War II, so California's sterilization program continued until 1979. The British Eugenics Society lasted until 1989, then changed their name to the Galton Institute, then to Adelphi Genetics Forum. So, you know, there is a, a term that, um, what's his, uh, I, I wrote it here, but um, somebody says is, is the eternal re return of eugenics, right? Um, it always comes back in, in one, some form. And, um, you know, and Galton, very, you know, famous for uh, statistics too, was the person who actually coined the term eugenics, right? He is Charles Darwin's cousin, and he's, you know, the founder of the modern eugenics movement, I'd say the first wave modern eugenics movement. Although, there were instances of what we'd call proto-eugenics before that, like if, you know, 
uh, Plato actually in the Republic talked about uh, <laughs> making sure that you know people were the inferior people were not able to um, reproduce and that the guardians and the elites and whatever would you know be encouraged to reproduce. So um, so these were the kind of the tenets of the, what, what I'd call first wave eugenics, right? Um, actually, Emil coined this term, first wave eugenics, um, starting 1883 plus. So you want to improve the human stock through positive and negative eugenics. So both methods, both positive and negative methods, it's important to note, were popular among many in the US and the Europe, not just Nazi Germany. Um, so I think that's important for us to understand, right? Because a lot of times people just associate eugenics with, with that. So the positive eugenics means, you know, you make those with quote unquote desirable traits breed and remove the people who have undesirable traits. So that way, through generations, you quote unquote improve the human stock. Negative um, eugenics means you stop the opposite, right? You stop those with quote unquote undesirable traits um, from breeding. Um, right, so um, those they can they call defectives, imb imbeciles, idiots, congenital invalids, morons, and quote unquote the feeble minded, and they identified them using IQ tests. And I mean, uh, I'm not going to talk about the history of IQ tests here, but those themselves are quite racist. Um, first wave eugenicists believe, right, Dalton, for example, that poverty was a result of one's inferior nature. Um, more recently, in 1994, there was this book, The Bell Curve, by Charles Murray, that basically says a similar thing, that social policies like welfare won't work because, um, you know, people's inherited uh, genetically de determined differences in IQ. So that's like the hereditary view of first wave eugenics. And obviously, you know, first wave eugenics also believed in the hierarchy of the races. So that's why they didn't want miscegenation laws. I mean, they didn't want miscegenation, which means like, you know, intermarriage, intermarriage along, uh, along the races. All right. So that was um, um, uh, the, the brief introduction to eugenics, right? So now let's talk about what we call um, second wave eugenics. And my, my co-author, thankfully, um, Emil, coined the term, um, the test grill bundle of ideologies. So let's go through the um, test scroll uh, bundle of ideologies and let's go through second wave eugenics. So, you know, uh, the, according to second wave eugenicists, they're like, what was wrong with the first wave eugenics? It was that, um, well, you know, the really the thing that was wrong was these population level um, improvements of the quote unquote human stock that you want to have resulted in horrible laws, right? Like genocide, like trying to sterilize people, et cetera. So first wave, second wave eugenicists are like, um, well, we can, we, can, um, we can do this without those kinds of laws, without those kinds of population things, right? So we don't need these population level policies. We can just have, you know, and we don't need to wait across generations to have these, you know, improvements of the quote unquote human stock, we can just, you know, improve the current human stock, right? I can improve myself. Parents can design their children based on, you know, uh, ge genetic um, engineering. So um, basically, you know, claims to be liberal because there's no coercion. Um, so that's sort of the, the more um, kind of uh, the second wave eugenics. So, so I would say the second wave eugenics so we'll talk about the test real bundle. But so let's talk about, you know, the test real bundle are transhumanism, extropianism, singularity, singularitanism, uh, cosmism, rationalism, effective altruism, and long-termism. So we'll go through them one by one. So transhumanism, right? The word transhumanism was coined in 1940 by Julian Huxley. And Julian Huxley was the president of the British Eugenics Society. Uh, from 1959 to 1962. So Julian Huxley writes, by controlling the mechanisms of heredity, the human species can, if it wishes, transcend itself, not just sporadically, but it's in, in its entirety as, as humanity. If enough people can truly say, I believe in transhumanism, then the human species will be on the threshold of a new kind of existence as different from ours as is uh, that of pecking man. It will at last be consciously fulfilling its real destiny. I'm making you suffer with me because I had to read this down the last whole month. So I'm not doing this alone. So anyways, so according to Julian Huxley, right? Again, 
uh, president of the British um, Eugenics Society. Um, you know, it, we can, humanity can just transcend being human, right? That's the goal. Um, and that really is the, the, the destiny, the collective destiny of humanity. So it's not just to improve the human stock, like the first wave eugenics, but it also is to transcend humanity altogether. So that was, I would say, early um, transhumanism, right? But mo modern transhumanism started in the late 80s slash 1990s. So they combined um, his vision, Huxley's vision of transcendence, with a new methodology of second wave eugenics, which can deter, which can um, depend on new technological advances like artificial intelligence or um, uh, nanotechnology or you know genetic engineering. So again, the point is that people could choose to quote unquote radically enhance themselves and become post-human. And what, be, what does being post-human mean? It becomes, it means to be a new superior species that you can create. So it's the same, you know, it's kind of like the roots are obviously first wave eugenics, right? But now you can create the superior human race without supposedly having population level coercive um, issues. So Nick Bostrom is one of the most famous um, transhumanists around. Um, and so he defines a posthuman as any being that has one or more posthuman capabilities, like indefinitely long health span, uh, health span augmented cognitive ca uh, capacities, enhanced rationality, etc. So that's transhumanism. And so the first um, organized transhuman movement started in 1993. They called themselves uh, the extropians. Um, there's five fundamental principles uh, of extropianism, boundless expansion, self-transformation, dynamic optimism, intelligent technology, spontaneous order. Um, so then a few years later, Nick Bostrom and David Pierce founded the World, the World Transhumanist Association, WTA. So we're at the E, we're at the extropian style. Uh, so, so now let's go to a singularitarian, I can't say this word, singularitanism, all right? And so these are the people who talk about the singularity. So this is another variant of transhumanism. Um, the leading advocates included Ray Kurzweil and um, Yudovsky, Elizabeth Yudovsky. Um, uh, I haven't, I don't know where Ray, Ray Kurzweil is around. I, I think he's sort of fizzled off, but I used to hear about him about five years ago, a lot more, five, six years ago. So they emphasize the coming quote unquote technological singularity. And what's the technological singularity? So there's two ways you can look at it. First is the point at which the rate of technological progress becomes so fast that it causes a fundamental rupture in human history. So human, they believe like humans and machines will merge, right? And life beyond that is hidden from view behind an event horizon. So us as humans can't even understand really what's, what's going to happen. We can't really imagine. So uh, according to Kurzweil, the universe as a whole will quote unquote wake up as intelligence spreads through it. He predicts this will happen in 2045. Yudovsky, however, predicted that this was going to happen in two years. So if you haven't made your plans um, for the singularity in 2025, I highly recommend that we all do it because, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen in two years. There's going to be an event horizon, some waking up uh, for the universe to do, you know, some intelligence uh, to be spread. But anyhow, that was, um, um, this is in this extropian um, listserv. Uh, where Yudovsky kind of, um, you know, according, oh, I don't know what calculations he did, but his calculations show 2025, there will be some sort of singularity. All right, so that's that's the first aspect. The second one, you know, is an intelligence explosion whereby algorithms undergo recursive self-improvement until they become quote unquote super intelligent. So that's another, that will be, that will, you know, that would have another history rupturing event. And so the resulting super intelligence could serve, further enable the merging of humans and machines and also the colonization of space, which is the collective human destiny. Um, so that's the singularitarianism. The next one is cosmism. What's cosmism? So uh, ben Gortzel's 2020 uh, Cosmos Manifesto says, you know, humans will merge with technology, which will inaugurate a new phase of the evolution of our species. So they're all, you know, transhuman, right? Um, it's the transcendence of humans merging with technology, etc. Um, we will develop sentient AI and mind uploading technology that permits an indefinite lifespan 
to those who choose to leave biology behind and upload. We will create, to, we will spread to the stars and roam the universe. We were going to create synthetic realities. We're going to develop scientific future magic. That's a quote. Um, much beyond uh, our understanding and imagination. So um, basically, these are transhumanists who are concerned about not just about how humans become post-human, but how post-humans transform the quote-unquote universe, right? That's cosmism. And then we have rationalism. So this kind of um, started around, two, you know, 2000, late 2000s. I think 2009 is when the less wrong community was founded by Yudovsky, who was a singularitarian and a, you know, transhumanist, right? And this is an, it says, they say it, they're an online forum and community dedicated to improving human reasoning and decision making, quote unquote, rational, rationality training. Uh, they say many members are heavily motivated by trying to improve the world as much as possible. The less wrong team are predominantly motivated by trying to cause, quote unquote, powerful AI outcomes to be good because they're so um, motivated by improving the world as much as possible. Um, and the, the singularity in the second sense uh, that I discussed, the intelligence explosion, has been one of the most central topics that um, they discussed. So that's um, rationalism. So now, you know, again, extropianism, singularitarianism, cosmism, they're all like transhumanists, right? They, they transhuman, they're all different kinds of transhumanists. Rationalists are not necessarily transhumanists, but they were founded by transhumanists, right? And also a singularitarian. Um, and, but they're very much into it. Like that's a lot of what they talk about is, you know, the, the, a lot of what they talk about is being transhuman and the singularity. That brings us to effective altruism. Um, effective altruism emerged around the same time as rationalism, and it's basically its sibling, right? Um, you can see it as, you know, when the principle of rationality is applied to the ethical domain. So how do you do the most good possible with finite resources? So there is a lot of overlap with the two communities, um, effective altruism and, and rationalism. And the initial focus was on global poverty, but, you know, after discovering Bostrom's book, uh, and his work in general, many members of the effective altruism community started to focus on the very long-term future of humanity. Some write, when we say long-term, millions, billions, or trillions uh, of years from now. Um, Bostrom imagined a techno-utopian future, right? Because of the human, the transhumanist kind of idea of the radical human enhancement. You can have radical human enhancement in many ways. And one of them is, again, uh, AI. Um, oh, <laughs> papel, I meant to say paper, but hey, uh, in a different language, that means paper too. Uh, so um, in a two, 20, 2003 paper um, titled Astronomical Waste, um, Bostrom said that if humanity colonizes the universe and creates planet-sized computers to run virtual reality worlds, um, and um, you know, populated by the digital people, the post-humans, the population could be 10 to the 38 in only the Virgo supercluster and at least 10 to the 58 within the accessible universe. Why are these numbers important? Because in total utilitarianism, our sole moral obligation is to maximize total quantity of net value, right? And if you have these 10 to the 58 digital people, think about 10 to the 58 digital people. And, and, and if you say they, they have net positive lives, that is astronomical, literally astronomical amounts of value. So that can be like the most good we can possibly do. And that should be our goal. Our goal should be to have these 10 to the 58 digital people have net positive lives that, you know, to generate um, astronomical amounts of value. So long-termism is when, you know, effective altruist reason, wait a minute, if our goal is the, to do the most good possible in the future can contain these astronomical numbers of people, that's what we should do instead, right? We should focus on that instead of current problems, except insofar as the current problems allow us to, you know, help those 10 to the 58 people have net, net positive, good positive lives. So um, long term, as Hillary Graves and uh, William McCaskill write about simply ignoring the effects contained in the first 100 or even 1,000 years. Um, and on the most canonical accounts of long-termism, being post-human, again, that transhumanist kind of idea, 
of transcending humanity and merging with machines, et cetera, talked about is, is a central component of quote unquote, fulfilling our long-term potential. And that reminds me of, again, uh, Huxley, who was the, you know, remember the president of the British um, Eugenic Society who wrote this, um, when he coined the term transhuman, he was talking about what our collective destiny is, right? Um, okay, so, uh, right. And so we're uh, here. So now we have learned about, right. And so according to Bostrom, right, even small probability increase, right, affecting this um, future that we're talking about, can mean literally saving billions of human lives today. So that's that's kind of basically what we should um, focus on. So we've learned about all of these different, um, uh, to, to summarize, we've learned about all of these different ideologies who uh, many of them have roots in transhumanism, which was created by first wave eugenicists, right? Now, what are some, um, some properties of these, um, what we call the test real bundle? First is, the historical roots of in contemporary communities. They have a common lineage, first back to first wave eugenics, both in goals and the actual people who founded it. They have, um, they're intimately connected to transhumanism. There's huge overlap in the various communities, right? Like many of the founders actually overlap, like for instance, you know, Yudovsky and Ballstrom, uh, et cetera, um, like uh, Gortzel and stuff. They're, they, you know, they're, they're all overlapping in various communities. Um, and um, they want to radically modify the human organism, right, in, in, in different ways. There is also um, what's called eschatology, like things about last things, conventions. And these take two forms, utopia and apocalypse. Uh, what's utopia? Utopia, uh, you know, it's kind of like the, um, it's the same as the Christianity, uh, David Pierce, the co-founder of WTA, called the transhumanist project Paradise Engineering. The complete abolition of suffering in Homo sapiens, the rest of the living world, cosmic rescue mission to promote paradise engineering throughout the universe. Bostrom's letter from Utopia, talk, Utopia talks about how the post-human has so much pleasure that they sprinkle it in our tea. Kurzweil, who was um, hired personally by Larry Page. <laughs> I see some people laughing in the audience. <laughs> Um, well, I had to take this seriously, so you got to listen to it with me, okay? So, <laughs> I'm just joking, but yeah, well, you know, this is this is what's going on. That's why I want to talk about it. So, Herzwell, who, who was hired by Larry Cage, says that the merger of man and machine coupled with the sudden explosion of machine intelligence will allow us to transcend our frail bodies with all their limitations, illness as we know it will be eradicated. Illness, as we know, it will be eradicated. We get to transcend our frail bodies as human beings. So that was the utopia, right? And first wave eugenicists also understood their project in utopian terms. So Galton wrote a utopian novel, for example, called The Eugenic College of Can't Say Where, <laughs> where parents have to uh, test to have tests before being pronounced to fit to reproduce, right? So that unfit parents were banished from this utopian place. So he wrote this novel. Of course, there's also the apocalypse. So in eschatology, you have the utopia and you have the apocalypse. So the apocalypse comes like this. It's like, well, we can have utopia if we have our artificial superintelligence and we become post-human and we have like, you know, all of this biotechnology, et cetera. But that can also bring us an apocalypse, right? The same technology that can bring us to utopia that can also bring produce quote unquote clear and future dangers that may be unprecedented that was um, Ray Kurzweil's term in human history artificial superintelligence can solve literally all of our problems all of our problems but if it's not quote unquote value aligned it could spell quote unquote doom that was Bostrom's um word um so but but the thing is, critically, even though they have these apocalyptic visions, they believe it is our duty, our moral obligation to bring humanity to utopia, even in spite of these risks. So both building utopia and avoiding the apocalypse are a priority. They should both be a priority for us. Finally, the, yeah, I mean, not finally, this is the third um, property. They all have highly discriminatory views, and that is 
it's not a it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise because you know comes from first wave eugenics. So first of all, intelligence, quote unquote, is really important for transhumanism because it, and and to quote unquote fulfill our collective human destiny. Why? Because it's really important to colonize space and become quote unquote post human. Um, I mean, Bostrom argued that blacks are more stupid than whites. Then he used the N word. In his 2002 paper, he wrote that dysgenic pressures were an existential risk to humanity as, as big as you know nuclear war, for example. What are dysgenic pressures? Dysgenic is the opposite term from eugenic, right? Eugenic, dysgenic. Dysgenic pressures means like less desirable people um, reproducing. So here is a, a quote from his um, paper. It says, currently it seems like that there are there is a negative correlation in some places between intellectual achievement and fertility. If such selection were to operate over a long period of time, we might evolve into a less brainy but more fertile species. Let, let's call it Homo philogro, I don't even know, Homo philoprogenitus, lover of many offspring. So this is an existential risk, according to him, because if dumber people reproduce, we get to you know, evolve into a dumber species. Basically, that's what he's saying. And that's an existential risk. Same um, Yudovsky, right? Like, so he just recently tweeted about, you know, IQs dropping in Norway. And he was like, oh, but it doesn't seem to be because of, you know, dumb people immigrating. So I guess we'll have to figure it out, right? So this is the same kind of um, attitude about intelligence. Um, they worried, but they knew though, in their conversations, they did worry that people were going to label them as um, neo-eugenics, racist, or neo-Nazis, etc. Um, but they, you know, like they say, since we as transhumans are seeking to attain the next level of human ev of evolution, which is basically kind of what the, eugen the first wave eugenicists were trying to do. Uh, but they do um, cite the support, um, you know, Charles Murray, uh, again, who wrote the Bell Curve uh, in 1994, and is like very well known for his um, anxieties about also dysgenic pressures, right, as, um, as, an, as a risk. Um, re more recently, there was this um, article that uh, Carla uh, Kramer wrote about how effective altruists had, um, like, were experimenting with a, t a new test score called the Peltive uh, score called um, Potential Expected Long-Term Instrumental Value to identify members of the community who are likely to develop high dedication. A low, um, a candidate with a normal IQ of 100 would be subtracted Peltive scores because points could only be earned above an IQ of 120. A uh, low Peltive value is not assigned to applicants who work to reduce global poverty or mitigate climate change, while highest value is assigned to those who directly work for EA organizations or an artificial intelligence. So, and then there was this article, you know, I'm not really going to talk about, about horrible um, har harassment, etc. So, so again, discriminatory views. And finally, influence. And why did I go through this whole entire thing talking about the history and all the different experience and all that? That's because of the influence. That's really what I want to get to. The influence. There are lots of billionaires in the movement, many who are either in it or adjacent to it, and many directly funding it, right? And this bundle of ideologies was a crucial motivating source behind the goal of creating AGI and moving resources and focus to it. So that's what I want to get to, right? The AGI now, like, now let's talk about AGI. AGI Utopia, AGI Apocalypse. So very briefly, you know, 1956, there was um, four guys who wrote this um, proposal um, to Rockefeller Foundation, wanted to have a summer where they, you know, uh, and that was the first time where, like, in written, you know, we saw the term AI um, officially coined. But a lot of time, you know, but back in the day, if you read their readings from like 1956, 1958 or whatever, the way they talk about what they've built was precisely kind of like how it is right now. They're like, oh my God, we have built a thinking machine and you will be amazed. And in five years, humans are not going to have to work anymore. What's going to happen? That's how they were talking back then too. So eventually that kind of, you know, high claims led to what some people call the AI winters, right? There were two waves of those winters. And so after those AI winters, a lot of researchers did not, a lot of researchers in fields that you would currently associate with AI, quote unquote AI, 
didn't really say they were AI researchers. It was like, you know, oh, I'm in machine learning. I'm in computer vision. I'm in natural language processing. I'm in, you know, robotics. They didn't really associate themselves with this whole, you know, larger general intelligence kind of goal. Um, so then in 2007, there was this um, book, again, um, where uh, Ben Gortzel and uh, Gortzel and Pension uh, christened the term AGI. Um, then, like, you know, before that, there was like Mary. By the, so in 2007, there weren't so many people talking about AGI, working on it, funding it, etc. Right. And so they weren't happy about this. Like they were talking about how, you know, this is really the field needs to move in this direction. We have a collection of quote unquote dumb specialists, you know, um, uh, doing various narrow AI, they call it domains. We want to work on AGI. Um, then you have, you know, um, so Ben Gortzel, if you remember, is a cosmist. So he believes that, you know, our, our goal is to be post-human and, you know, colonize the cosmos and the cosmos and make the cosmos happy, not just humans. Then Miri was founded by Yudovsky, um, and, and their goal was to basically make AGI safe. Then 2010, Define was founded by the same goal, right? Um, make AGI safe. So funded by all these test group, you know, the billionaires, test criminalists, billionaires like Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, et cetera. Um, but, you know, and uh, uh, Bostrom Superintelligence comes out. Um, and then, you know, DeepMind is bought by Google in 2014. That year, I don't know if any of you remember how Elon Musk, that's when he started talking about like, um, you know, doom based on AI as the single biggest threat. Um, oh, why did I forget? The whole, the, the, my entire thing was to get to uh, open AI. I don't know why I didn't put it in there. Then after 2014, after this happened, open AI was founded for, by the same, for the same goal, which is to make AGI safe. So basically, People like Elon Musk and um, Sam Altman were not happy that DeepMind was getting bought by Google. They're like, oh my God, we can have this doom. Um, and, you know, DeepMind is working on AGI and we can't have Google controlling that. So they start, so they, you know, start OpenAI. They say that it's going to be a nonprofit. But in 2019, they, uh, be, you know, become a, non a for profit. They get 1 billion from Microsoft. You know, this year they get 10 billion from Microsoft, right? So, um, Sam Altman talks about how Yudovsky was actually very important in, um, in the decision to start OpenAI, and he was very important in like getting DeepMind funding, et cetera. So the whole point I want to make here is that they are like driving the whole, you know, AGI um, craze. Um, so why are they doing that? Well, you know, again, we talked about AGI utopia and AGI uh, apocalypse. There's two ways in which we can get AGI utopia. The first one is like, you have an AGI that's gonna be so intelligent that it will figure out what to do in any scenario, right? So Ilya Seskover, when, um, you know, chief scientist at OpenAI, he was asked at um, a conference at Stanford, like, um, and he said, you know, in the future, the AGI will tell us whether we should use GPT-3 or something like that. Scenario two is again, the transhumanist view, right? Where we will have morally superior beings um, right, because you'll have AGI enhanced transhuman minds benefiting the cosmos. Um, and that's what Ben Gortzel talks about. He calls it like transhuman AGI, like that is the goal uh, of building AGI. And so um, they talk about then we will have uh, these post humans will have growth and joy beyond what humans are capable of. Abundances of wealth, growth to all minds who so desire. Um, Sam Altman says, it's clear we will have unlimited intelligence and energy before the decade is out. The future can be un almost unimaginably great. Once AI to arrive, growth will be extremely rapid. Changes coming are unstoppable. Um, we can create a much fairer, happier, and pr prosperous uh, world. Um, but like for whom? For whom has this utopia arrived, right? So Nando um, is talking about how, you know, uh, what we need to do is just scale these mod models, you know, it's, um, it's game over um, if you scale these models, like large language models or something like that, um, you'll get to AGI. Um, so now, you know, this race, because um, basically because they want to create AGI, and that's the goal, has created a whole race, right? OpenAI has, you know, has to release like chat GPT. Now Google has to do this. Now, you know, Microsoft, now DeepMind has to... So they've been like basically creating larger and larger models as advertised as being able to do everything for everyone. Um, so in terms of large language models, we have you know the paper on the uh, stochastic parrots um, 
Uh, oh no, that's not my title. I, I, that's, that's not the title of my paper. It's on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Don't tell anybody, but um, yes. So we, we talk about, you know, the, the issues perpetuated by large language models. Like as, one is bias, perpetuating biases, associating, you know, black people with violence, Muslims with violence, women with stereotypical careers, et cetera. I mean, I'm not gonna go through, through that, but the fact that you are, um, um, using lots and lots of internet um, text to train these models and what that represents leads to all of these issues. Text to image models, right? Like DALI and um, I guess um, stable diffusion um, from stability AI, um, all the issues there. Um, and now, you know, on top of this, they're racing to have a search engine based on these things, right? And that is in line with the goal of having quote unquote an AGI that knows everything, tells you everything, right? Can like answer any question. But um, if you read, for example, I recommend the paper um, uh, Situating um, Search by Emily Bender and Chirag Shah, who talk about how it's really important to have prevent provenance. When I'm seeking information, I need to put it in context. I need to have, I need to know who it's coming from. I need to know how I can kind of, um, uh, figure out whether it's true or false or, you know, whether it is like discriminatory or not. I can't just have an an, an answer from some quote unquote all knowing thing, right? That's already dangerous. Um, you know, and finally, you know, again, th they talk about like, you know, uh, unlimited intelligence and energy. Um, Peter Voss even writes about how nobody's going to have to work because of AGI. They talk about how we're going to have a fairer, fairer, happier, most more prosperous uh, world. But like, look at the worker exploitation. Actually, we're going to have an event where one of these people is going to join us anonymously because they're worried about their um, identity being um, ex uh, disclosed. But there was recently an article in Time where these Kenyan workers who were paid like one dollar an hour right? Remember the utopia? It was supposed to be like unlimited wealth for everyone, right? They have, they're paying them $1 an hour to filter out toxic texts from chat GPT and they're mentally scarred, right? There's like all sorts of horrible texts that they're, they have to filter out to help OpenAI create some sort of automated filter so that the rest of us don't have to see this stuff. Um, they had to do a similar thing in some of these text to image models. Um, and so, you know, obviously that's not the kind of, you know, we don't have utopia for, we're not at the utopia at all, it's the complete opposite. And then finally, there's a lot of centralization of power that's going on. So, uh, I'm getting almost out of time, um, but, you know, one example is resources that could have gone to a whole bunch of different groups of people, um, you know, serving their own communities are now going to like one company that or two companies, let's say, that claim to do to have one model for everything, right? Um, <laughs> for example, I mean, um, we were working just on, an, on another paper where we were analyzing actually the claims of, let's say, you know, Facebook came up with this, um, I mean, Meta came up with this paper called No Language Left Behind, where they literally claim to solve machine translation for all languages, right? And they even have, um, you know, they have certain languages like Amharic, Tigrinya, um, that are spoken in Ethiopia. And we looked at their data set, we looked at their models for those languages, and it is laughable, right? For example, part of their data has outputs of Google translated text. So it's like, tra you know, tra testing on your training set, right? So your their training data has synthetic test that is output from Google, tra <laughs> the output of Google trans Translate, right? You can't have that as an evaluation for a machine translation task. Um, they have, you know, instead of having uh, many of their URLs are actually from Russia, not Ethiopia, stuff like that. But then they claim to have one model that does everything, which means then people like Lesson, a machine translation company, focus, specialize on those languages, can't get funding because people go, they, they hear this kind of claim and they're like, oh, you know what? Uh, sorry, um, Meta has, um, you know, solved it with uh, no language left behind and OpenAI has solved it with Whisper. So we don't need your kinds of companies anymore. At the same time, we know that those kinds of claims are not true. Um, and finally, you know, these uh, leaders like Sam Altman talks about how in the next five years, 
you know, uh, their models are going to, you know, be able to give medical advice and, uh, you know, lawyers and replace lawyers and all of that. And then obviously what's going to happen, you're, you're just going to have to pay them <laughs> for anything, uh, any task anywhere. So, you know, what? what it, 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 it's not power for everyone. It's not like wealth for everyone. What's happening is actually they're attempting to centralize power. And the final thing I want to say is um, really quickly go through, again, because you have the eschatology, the last things, there's the utopia and there's apocalypse. So the apocalypse is obviously that we're going to have, um, again, um, we're going to um, remove our ability to have utopia uh, because of an existential risk, because of artificial superintelligence, et cetera, right? And like I said, we're morally obligated to both have create the AGI utopia and prevent the AGI apocalypse. So they frame both as a safety issue, creating AGI and preventing the AGI apocalypse. But then according to them, preventing the AGI apocalypse is much more about the, the people a thousand years from now not existing, right, rather than that current event, the current um, harms to current marginalized groups. So they create those harms by pumping resources into AGI, but then they, at the same time, um, prevent us from investigating those harms by, by saying, oh, no, what we really should focus on is not the current harms and issues, right? It's like the long, you know, the, the, the humanity's potential to achieve utopia, like, um, and colonize space or something like that. Um, the other issue is um, when we frame things as AGI, we are allowing the people building these systems to evade accountability, right? You're talking about an artifact as if it is a thinking machine. You're talking about an artifact as if it's not a company, you know, taking data for, from um, millions of people without their consent, like artists, for example, um, and, um, you know, ex having exploited workers, et cetera. You're, you're ascribing all of these, you um, uh, properties to an actual artifact, a thing. So that allows them to evade responsibility. So there's this thread by artist Carla Oritz um, who talks about how, you know, you can't say like these kinds of images are inspired by humans just like artists are inspired by humans. And she goes through why that's not the case. And finally, I want to close by saying, you know, trying to build AGI is inherently unsafe. Like it's an unscoped, unscoped, undefined, uh, thing for which it's very difficult. What is your hypothesis and how are you going to have experiments that have what we call construct validity? Um, what is, from an engineering perspective, what is your, what's your spec? What's, what's the standard operating conditions? What is your expected behavior? What is, you know, like, how are we going to perform stress tests, tests et cetera? Um, like, what's the standard operating condition for a system this was Galactica, right? They were like, it can summarize academic literature, solve math problems, generate wiki articles, write scientific code, annotate molecules and proteins, and more. Like, how do I test this system? What, what, where do I even start? So, I mean, I want to say, you know, uh, stop, let's stop with this whole AGI thing, right? That's just not, I think that it's not about making quote unquote AGI safe. It's just an inherently unsafe practice trying to build it. Um, and so that's basically what I want to say. And I'm sorry, I don't, you know, yeah, let's, let's, let's have time for questions. I didn't plan to go that long. <laughs>